Yeah, thank you very much for an invitation. Just regarding the last point about the uh, content information efforts, just mentioned, I just recently saw uh, Professor Gang Zhao in the NSF meeting. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah, the Brown, uh, the Department of Physics at Brown has a very special place in my heart. Um, and uh, I consider um, having Brad, Professor Brad Marston as my advisor as one of the um, fortunate things in my life. So it's a, uh, it's a pleasure to be here in many, for many reasons. Um, so the, I'm, I'm going to talk about work that I did with uh, Shane Kelly, who, is, uh, who was a graduate student of mine at UCR. Um, he, uh, we collaborated with somebody at Los Alamos, Eddie Timmermans. Shane graduated recently, just a few, few months ago, and is now a postdoc uh, in Germany. I will talk a little bit more about them at the end. Uh, almost everything I will describe here today is in this one paper here, okay, this PRA uh, from 2019. Okay, so I'm talking about cat states, um, Schrodinger cat, and uh, in particular macroscopic cat states. And um, we'll be, um, so states in a superpos quantum superposition. And uh, the question I want to address is how to experimentally uh, measure, detect whether it's th this macroscopic state is really in an indefinite state. There's a property that is not defined, it's, it's a superposition, or uh, whether the, this state is in a mixture of, let's say, individual atoms in um, uh, alive and dead states, of, of definite alive and dead states. Okay, so. Um, oh. Okay, it's not, okay. So the, uh, again, the main question, uh, how to establish the indefiniteness of um, cat state's vital status? Uh, um, and actually there's a follow-up question as soon as I, um, related to that question, whether it's a real indefinite property or a classical mixture. Uh, once you answer that it is a cat state, there's also the question of quantifying how macroscopic it is, quantifying the size of the cat. Okay, I'm, um, I'm going to start with a very specific, simple model. Uh, I will talk about uh, how we imagine uh, this is a specific system where these cat states can be created dynamically. So I'll describe that. And then um, uh, once that is created, we, I will discuss uh, some issues about indefiniteness and measures of, um, of that. Uh, don't worry about the, the, what these words, uh, it shouldn't make sense as, as we go through. So some of the later steps will be somewhat formal and they'll have to introduce new quantities, but I'm going to start with a very um, simple physical system. So the bosonic interferometer I have in mind is just a system with bosons that can be in one of, of two modes. So it could be, and I note here, I, A1 and A2. So, harmonic oscillator operators. So, we could think about this as a spatial modes, um, uh, for example, double well potential, and A1, A2 are just left or right potential. So, some simplified version of the double well potential could be two actual physical guides. Uh, it could be some internal degrees of freedom, um, such as hyperfine states. In the first case, um, these uh, can be controlled by changing the shape of the potential to change the, um, the occupations. In the other case, for example, with external fields. Okay, very simply, this, um, uh, this system of many bosons uh, can be mapped, can be modeled by, um, if each one, each boson can be mapped as a spin two level system, a spin half, then the whole system can be mapped as a large SU2 spin. This is an exact mapping if you only have two modes. Um, you know, the quantization action JZ would be the population imbalance between, say, the left well and the right well, and the JX and JY uh, have um, um, a create and destroy uh, the, it has J plus and J minus, so involve uh, hopping between the, the two, two modes. 
okay, that's exact. And uh, essentially what we're doing is mapping the original basis, natural basis, which will be occupation in each mode into now uh, some effective spin that has um, JZ and J components. Here's the mapping. I can write the spin in any direction I want now in terms of these uh, X, Y, and Z components by specifying uh, theta and phi. Uh, these um, satisfy um, uh, and, uh, spin implementation relations. Um, okay, this is the simple model I will be having in mind. Uh, and uh, Hamiltonian that can be created in the system is uh, here in red. Uh, just a term where let's imagine two sides, left and right. I can hop between the two sides and there is an interaction term. So this can be created in the lab in various different uh, uh, systems. And this, this type of uh, simple models have been studied um, uh, extensively before. Okay, so what is this? Um, just to gain some, um, some physical intuition, one interesting limit here is to look at the semi-classical uh, trajectories. Everything I, I'm going to talk about here is going to be fully quantum, but this gives us some nice intuition. So in the large uh, interaction limit, large compared to this scale, and I want to be in the very microscopic case, so n is large, so here I chose some numbers that are in this regime. Uh, then uh, the semi-classical trajectories can, uh, are like this. So essentially JZ component has magnitude uh, uh, Z times some overall scale J. And uh, the, uh, so that's the second term here. And the uh, J X, J Y have in the plane has magnitude one, square root of one minus Z squared with a, a Z neutral angle here to project on the J X axis. That's all. Okay, so that's semi-classical. And, but when I look at the, the, the interface uh, space, how this looks like, this is what we have. The, um, it has a very simple um, a physical interpretation. Again, the, what, what this is, these lines that should be connected really, are um, equal energy lines of, of the semi-classical or, or classical uh, Hamiltonian. And uh, these would be the, as you do time evolution, it will follow these lines. And you have different, uh, two different regimes, separate, separatrix. In, 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 in the middle here, you start with a small Z, small imbalance. And as you go, go around, what this is doing is um, uh, oscillating back and forth, okay, between that value, uh, uh, between zero. Uh, but there is also another regime where you start with a large imbalance, large Z in one end or the other, and uh, this is the self-trapping regime where what the, the dynamics after that is that it will still oscillate uh, a little bit, but uh, a majority will, uh, a large portion will stay, and then there's some oscillation. That's self-trapping. This, uh, this, if you look at, look at these uh, curves, you may rec have recognized that this is also the uh, phase space trajectories of a simple pendulum, classical pendulum. Okay, this is uh, here, uh, the red region would be the pendulum here, just doing oscillations back and forth. And um, uh, the, the blue region would be the pendulum actually going around one direction or the other, and the two are not connected. If you start on this branch, you don't come here. Okay, and then this is the classical separatrix here that this, uh, is, uh, sorry, this, uh, um, um, there's an unstable fixed point there, which corresponds to the completely inverted uh, pendulum. A tiny a change can make it go one way or the other. Okay, so that's the, the classical, um, behavior of this Hamiltonian, this quantum Hamiltonian, we will be looking at very large N. So we are somehow approaching this limit because remember if you have large N, we are essentially having some large overall scale J in the Hamiltonian and um, large J, a uh, large H scale means small H bar. So that, that kind of um, connects. Okay, so that's good intuition. So what is the cat state that we talk about here? The cat state can be prepared in the following way. Uh, uh, you have this 
phase space. Let's start with the fully quantum program, but let's start with the initial uh, state that is a, some, a coherent state, uh, say along this separatrix and let it evolve, okay? So I will actually consider two special points. Here it's the pi, uh, phi equal pi and z equal zero. And uh, another point in the separatrix will, will I'll consider is phi equals zero. So I, for the remainder talk, I will sometimes mention the pi state or the zero state. These are the states uh, created by having an initial state at these, uh, around this, this uh, point or this point. And let it evolve. Now, when it evolves, because this is a real quantum problem and you have some finite distribution, some, some Gaussian, some Korean state on, on, in that, uh, around that point, uh, as it evolves, it will go into both sides. Okay, so here, and, and then let's say I, uh, um, I uh, measure, I look at the probability, this is um, for uh, different occupations, different imbalances. So initially I have some, um, th this is for the, the zero state where I have some, uh, some value of Z here that, um, uh, that is on the separatrix. And um, as it evolves, it creates the cat dynamically. This can be seen um, by uh, following the classical trajectories. So here uh, in this lower plot here, if I started somewhere deep in this, uh, the, the center region, the, even the quantum problem, it will sort of just stay here and smear out has interference, but stay here. Um, the other case, I would have a, a lot of weight out here. Here I started in the separatrix, this would be the uh, phi equals zero state. And as it evolves, it spreads out, but there is a particular special time in which if I stop, uh, I have this double peak structure. I have a lot of weight here and here. So that's the cat. Well, that's a, something that may look like a cat. We'll have to answer. Um, we'll have to come up with some diagnostic to say whether it's a cat or not. Uh, here, this is a phi, phi, equal, phi zero equal pi state. It's more symmetric, but sort of the same idea. Okay, and then as, um, here, don't worry too much about here. This is the, the time and here is some kind of relative entropy um, to, to see that this is um, uh, what is plot. The panels here on top are at these points here, the points um, in which the snapshot was taken. And this, the cat is, is, is um, the best cat uh, is at the point of maximum entanglement, maximally entangled state. Okay, so this is, uh, without uh, going into too much detail, this is how the cat is created, just evolving the Hamiltonian once you start with um, uh, something close to uh, the eigenstate of J in some particular direction. When I specify Z and phi, I'm just specifying some direction to start with. Can okay. I just ask a question? Yeah. So are to get this uh, time evolution, are you integrating the Schrodinger equation? Um, is that is that how you're doing that, or how how, how do you get? Is this is a quantum evolution here that you're showing? Is that right? This is a full quantum evolution done numerically. Uh -huh. um, yes, just evolving, uh, just doing full time evolution for using Schrodinger's equation. Okay. And um, so the Hilbert space, so how large is the Hilbert space here? You okay, have... yeah. So uh, this is done with, um, I believe, 100 particles. 100 particles. 100 particles can be. They could be in one of two states. So uh, it's right. a pretty large Hilbert space. Um, yes. Um, uh, Okay. Yes, so, uh, I'm sorry. I think that there, there are some uh, approximations. So we, we, we start, um, we start with um, a basis in the, this coherent state and um, uh, it, it's like a, using the Wigner function, uh, Wigner distribution along the, this phase space. And, um, and evolve that, um, and that, um, that evolution 
uh, is more optimal than just listing all the, um, uh, you know, a hundred um, uh, 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 squared right. states. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is numerics. Yeah, I'm sorry, there, there are some approximations, some well-controlled approximations there. Okay, so that, that would be the cat state. And um, now we can also introduce temperature. And uh, uh, so the, the first plot is what we had before, just pure state evolving. Uh, we can uh, consider an ensemble and, uh, and evolve that. And uh, the, the, the thing is, uh, some of the same arguments in which the, the cat is formed also is there uh, when introduced temperature. And here it involves relatively large temperature. This is uh, this, um, uh, this um, uh, beta epsilon is uh, one over 10. Uh, but so you can do it at different temperature. And the question is, what happens first? Will, uh, will it smear out uh, so that the alive and the dead are not well distinguished anymore? Or will we still keep uh, the, the definition of alive and, and the dead, but actually not be indefinite anymore, become a mixture because of temperature? Uh, so uh, uh, the, the question is, when we look at this uh, zero temperature and finite temperature, they all have this double peak structure. Are they really cats? And when they are, how big? How, 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 what, um, how big is the cat? Okay, so these are the two questions to let, let I'm going to uh, talk first about distinguishing alive and dead, having enough separation to have a well-defined big cat. And then uh, that's easier. We can define some difference here and see um, if that's large. The question of if it's a superposition, we want to be able to answer that from measurements, some particular set of measurements, that's a, a more subtle one. Okay. Now, so about the, uh, what is alive and dead? It here is just the definition, the visual definition. So essentially uh, when um, it's occupying, um, uh, which side of the absolute value of JZ. So uh, the question, the, this um, quantity that I, um, we will use, it was introduced by Leggett, is extensive difference. Essentially, the, this difference here, where P1 and P2 are the probabilities. So if these are well separated, then um, uh, it uh, tells us that there is, um, uh, uh, a large difference. When you start to smear out, then then it becomes small. We can compare that with the maximum value of JZ. Okay, so that is uh, how we distinguish the two states. Now the indefiniteness, um, what I mean by that is the usual definition. So you would have those two well-defined states and the cat is indefinite if it's in a superposition of the two, some superposition. In general superposition. Um, so no, no, no um, amount of information, no measurement. There's nothing I can do to reduce that uncertainty. Okay, I, that uncertainty can be um, will come out in some measurements. If you repeat measurements of uh, measurement of some quantity, you will see variance. It's all there, but there's nothing I can do to decrease that. So we will want as we go on to quantify that, and when experiment measures some uncertainty. We want to have a way to put bounds on the source of that. Okay, whether it came from indefiniteness or something else. Okay, definite is, um, it's just a mixture. So I, I have to describe it as some density matrix with sums of well-defined alive, well-defined dead. Okay, and here are the pictures to keep in mind. We have things in pure state, uh, even a pretty high temperature, we still have these. Uh, they, they both have uh, uh, comparable extensive difference, but now we need to, to consider indefiniteness. Okay, so one of these is not a cat, a Schrodinger cat. Okay. 
All right. So um, now uh, maybe, maybe let's come back here. And um, in order to to get a um, a measure of this uh, uncertainty, um, we will probe this um, uh, our system in different ways. So I will subject it to uh, uh, this number of interferometry steps. Okay, so it may not, the motivation may not be completely clear at this point, but um, so let, let's consider this procedure. Um, you, number one, you prepare a state, okay? Could be a, uh, some state that is represented by rope. It could be a pure state or a mixture. Um, the, the, the usual uh, steps are, you can do a step where you encode the phase, in some contexts, this may be the phase that contains some information and we want to measure it. Uh, but okay, we will encode the phase by um, letting it evolve with some unitary um, operator. So he, the unitary operators we will be considering here are where the Hamiltonian is just a component of the J, the spin. So it could be a rotation in some direction. Okay, so you do that, evolve, and uh, encode the phase. Now, there's one more step, which is a bit uh, tricky to distinguish. It's the readout. Instead of just measuring, there's a readout step where uh, depending on what you want to measure, you may want to do that operation in order to prepare for your measurement. Let's say I had a phase because I evolved in time, did something or, or did nothing. I just want to calculate something about the initial state. The readout, for example, could be, let's say an experiment, it's easy to measure the population balance, the JZ component. Um, uh, but if I want to have information about JX, what I could do here in step three is rotate my system uh, in, JY, in Y direction by 90 degrees and bring JX to, to JZ and then measure JZ. So something along the, those lines. So, this way, by doing the various rotations, I can choose what is what I'm going to measure. Okay. Uh, step two is some phase that is encoding, and then they want uh, I want inform, um, uh, to do measurements later that would tell me information about that. Uh, step three is I can choose what kind of measurements I do by by rotating and doing the measurements. And finally, the step four is just measurement. It will, destroy the state will project. So I can also choose what to measure uh, and uh, that would uh, project into one of these eigenstates. So if I repeat this um, uh, uh, without, just in general, I will, um, each time I measure this, I will get uh, uh, some probability uh, distribution. I mean, when I repeat, I, I can build a um, probability distribution that depends on, uh, how much uh, I rotate, uh, how the phase I encoded, uh, what I chose to read, um, the observable R that I chose, and um, omega, just everything else, uh, some parameters. Maybe I started the state in a um, uh, five or zero state or some other parameters here. So, but the key thing is by doing this, I can create these, um, these distributions. We'll be using this information in these distributions by properly choosing these steps to um, get information about the uncertainty in, um, in my cat state and how much of that uncertainty came from quantum indefiniteness. Could, could I just ask, uh, yes. in the back of your mind, are you thinking about like a cold atom experiment with bosonic atoms and in a double well uh, yes, potential. That, that would, that's a good, I think, let, let's all keep that in mind, for example. That, that is the most visual that has experiments. Uh, so uh, from Marcus or the Taller group in, in Austria, they have done these kind of calculations, uh, measurements and have created the kind of systems. And so they would have to go uh, prepare the state multiple times and yes. steps uh, in order to accumulate the statistics uh, for the probability of distribution. Yes, yeah. So they have to recreate this, um, so hopefully in identical things that 
So first say project condense everything in, in the pi, zero, uh, pi, pi state and then let it evolve and then do, the, do something and then repeat and repeat. And they can do that many, many times. They, they have done similar things, not for our, our proposed sequence, but for other things. Thanks. Okay, so, um, uh, okay, but the, again, the motivation to, to uh, distinguish between, um, it was to distinguish between those two, two double peak structures and uh, um, another um, the simple physical picture is, if one is a cat, the other is a mixture, um, the cat is the one that if you, that, that can interfere. So you need some to put it through some dynamics and let it and see if it interferes or not. So that's kind of the idea. And it will distinguish from the pure um, mixture that does not interfere. It will have, you know, a certain design of that, but uh, will not have that component. So that does the interferometry steps. Okay, so can we have some quantity that estimates or put bounds on how much um, variance there is in this phase, for example. So um, the quantity that does that is the so-called class uh, feature information. Here's the definition. Okay, so I, I, having, um, you can forget about quantum mechanics for, for, uh, for a minute, that is the motivation, but if you have some classical distribution where um, your measurement, your measured observable is some parameter R and you have some distribution for R and that distribution may depend on some parameter uh, psi, uh, the feature information is defined this way. It, um, the idea is to have something that quantifies or estimates uh, how much information, what, once I measure some uh, observable R, how much information that contains about my psi. So, so, and this does that. It has been, it's, um, that's why it's so widely used. It, um, for that quantity, there is this kramer rao bound that has been proven, which says that this quantity exactly provides a bound for this um, uh, delta psi. The variance. Okay. So the more, the larger this amount of information, if you want this class coefficient information is, the more tightly constrained this variance is. Uh, next slide, I will give a little motivation, try to get a little motivation about why this should have this form. But this is the reason I'm going to for now uh, focus on this quantity. Um, just go ahead a little, I will do this quantity here when task, uh, feature information was introduced, this would be any, could be any random distribution and or some parameter that determines could be some distribution uh, of grades and um, you have some parameter which is, I don't know, as you do different questions with different degrees of difficulty, any parameter. Here, I will use the same framework, uh, but we will be the observation, the, um, um, the parameter will be something I can um, I can code in the, the five phase, and then R will not be something random, but I will choose all possible observables that I can um, uh, R that can be used in the interferometry process. But, but okay, let's stay with just classical. So this is what we have, uh, and this can be measured instrumentally. It's a lot of work, but one can. Um, uh, go through because these uh, these probability distribution can be measured. Then, the, therefore, um, the feature information can be obtained by measuring that. Uh, actually, building derivatives explicitly by changing this parameter. Okay, so uh, uh, this is another reason why it's useful because it can be measured experimentally. Okay, a little um, uh, motivation why it should be. Uh, defined this way. Uh, well, we, we do want, it, it's sort of normal that it should have a derivative of the, um, of the probability. Like if you, um, uh, so it's how the probability changes with um, 
contains information. If the probabilities were all the same and you measure something that doesn't contain much information. So it should, should contain um, um, derivatives. If you just did the first derivative, actually this would give you zero because um, P appears here. Okay, but anyway, maybe another way of to motivate this is that if you look at the log likelihood, log of P and consider the derivative, this quantity sort of contains what we want. If uh, we have large probability for everybody, then that's little information, a small probability, and measure that, that gives a lot of information. And um, if things are changing a lot, that contains more information. So L prime is sort of a measure, but um, we should um, consider average, so um, the square and, and do the average. That's sufficient information. You can also see it as the variance of this, lot, of this uh, quantity uh, because um, by the definition, um, this, um, uh, this, the second term here is zero. Okay, so maybe that motivates a little why it has this form, this log, uh, log likelihood and there should be derivative and um, the square can take the average. But okay, this is not, not necessary for the remaining of the talk. What is necessary is just, this is a good measure. It's a good measure because giving a bound through the prime round bound. So and if I approach this from a sort of practical standpoint and I want to use a, a Schrodinger cat state to make a very sensitive measurement of a phase, for instance. And this formula would tell me that I want to make the probability distribution have these peaks so that uh, F is as large as possible. And then that means that the uncertainty in the phase is as small as possible. And is that, am I interpreting yeah. that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, now, at this point, uh, um, the R can still be, um, you could have various choices of R. You, you can, um, you could be, have chosen R to be JX, say, and then be doing various measurements and uh, getting the probabilities. Uh, so um, right now, this quantity still sort of depends on what you want to measure. So that leads me to the next, uh, to connect back with the interferometry proposal. So there, we got some probability distribution through the steps, and that depended on, um, you know, the redox that it shows. Uh, so the same uh, sensibility with respect to psi applies, but I have various choices of R. Um, that's okay. For each one, I will have my classical Fisher information. Now, the, the definition of quantum Fisher information is um, the of all the possible Rs, uh, the maximum one, because that will give me the minimum um, uh, variance in psi. Okay, so the quantum feature information is simply the maximum of the classical feature information for any for all choices of the readout. Uh, um, since that's the maximum, and uh, then that that is the, the absolute bound. Everything the, that gives you the smallest of the variance here. Okay, so that's the quantum kernel bound. Okay. Um, Okay, never mind how we are going to do that, but so that, that is the, the steps. And now let's say, let's say we, the, the, the phase we will encode is simply rotating with, with respect to the, the spin in some direction, any direction we want. Uh, then the phase, you know, we're just rotating and, uh, and applying that to my state. And the delta um, uh, of this angle is, um, Proportion delta t. So essentially, what this is saying is uh, this in here, what I have is a measure of delta t. So the larger um, uh, my quantum Fisher information, more information, this thing responds faster. Okay, delta t is small. 
that's a, uh, um, okay. So I can imagine rotating the state and uh, that will, delta psi will have, um, will be related to delta t. And uh, actually there is uh, a theorem that is, uh, can, can be proven if you take this definition of um, the quantum Fisher information and apply it to a pure state uh, with um, a uh, phase encoding of this form, with this Hamiltonian here, equal to J, then uh, the um, uh, Fisher information, quantum Fisher information is directly equal up to a factor of four to this variance. Okay, this delta J squared variance is, um, you know, J squared minus the absolute value J squared. Just the, the usual definition of variance. So this actually just straight away gives me um, Heisenberg uncertainty. Okay, so now we have, we want to distinguish the, the two double peaked structures. We realize that there's some, in one case, there's some interference. So we have to do something dynamical. We, we can evolve with any Hamiltonian we choose different directions. And um, we have these estimators now, okay? Uh, the key thing at this point is just this bound. Okay, now, uh, so for, for a pure state, that's essentially all there is. So any, if, if you know it's a pure state already, which you really don't, but if you know it's a bound state and any variance you measure must be coming from uh, quantum definitions, there's nothing else. So that is this statement here. Okay, the the um, fish information gives a measure of a bound for the, um, uh, for, the, for, the, for the variance. And that is um, uh, uh, exactly the, the quantum uncertainty for on, on that measurement. Okay, what about a mixture? Can we, how, how can we put bounds? So if we, if we have a mixture, it's a little schematic. Uh, let, let's say there is some row, some density matrix. Um, I, I can, uh, I know how to do things with for a pure state. Well, a mixture, uh, any density matrix can be decomposed in these ways uh, in terms of pure states, uh, of density matrix for, for pure states. So let's say I have a bunch of different ways of doing that. And each one of you give me a different one. I can decompose it. It's not unique. Some of these bases is maybe more complete. Uh, so for each one of those, I know how to calculate the Fisher uh, information and make bounds for each one of these uh, little density of states for pure state. So I can calculate that quantity where I have this probability and just the uh, quantum Fisher information for that pure state. And this, <laughs> Um, represented by the size of the circles, say, tell me, well, these are not, not the same. They have various different values. Uh, but very uh, nice result that has been proven is that of all these possible values, if I plot them somehow as a function of, for different ensembles, uh, the, there's a minimum value. And the minimum value is uh, the, um, quantum Fisher information for the mixture. So the quantum Fisher information for the mixture, which I can calculate from the definition, uh, is actually equal to the smallest of the the of these quantities here. Okay, it's um, written here in this uh, formal way. But but here's the picture. You can if you imagine decomposing things that that. that Decomposing into very different ensembles seems like a completely um, formal thing. You can choose any basis, no, very, no observable should depend on that. But actually it has physical implications because if, if you have some, I don't know, some purification scheme or something, you, these different schemes may tell you what is better. You may, you may want to choose to, to uh, create that mixture through different choices of pure state that may be more advantageous. Okay, but what we need here is that even in the worst case, that the smallest of these quantities here, um, the, 
the quantum fish information still captures put, um, uh, is a measure of something that cannot go below that. Okay. So then, uh, so let's take um, the, that, that quantity that cannot be decreased any further than, uh, as my, what I call the actual quantum uncertainty. Okay, so that will be the measure of something I call the quantum variance, quantum uncertainty. Uh, so I can measure classical fissure information. I can obtain, if I could, if I could do, imagine maximizing, I could obtain the quantum fissure information. And then I can get this measure, which is an uncertainty, which is purely of quantum origin. Okay, okay. so the uh, interesting quantity to look that we propose is this ratio here. This uncertainty, which is purely quantum, uh, over just a statistical um, uncertainty you measure, we would measure in experiment. That is the uncertainty you measure just by creating the state, doing the measuring you want, without encoding anything and, and doing any readout. Say, I just create and, and measure JZ and uh, repeat, repeat. That's the, the, the that's the that's what is showing those pictures with the double peak. That's the variance. So so now let's compare those two. This is the minimum. I, this is the fully quantum piece, and this is everything. Everything what you actually measure. So at most this R could be one, and that's the best cat. And but in general it would be lower. Oh, maybe. sorry, I forgot to plug in. Um, so, uh, so that is the quantity in combined with the extensive difference that would, um, would be the um, diagnostic. So first, ext large extensive difference, so we can define um, uh, the alive and dead and then um, have this ratio uh, close to one. So let's say it's not really one, it's 0.6 or 0 0.8. How can we know if it's uh, good enough or not? Maybe look at this reduced extensive difference. So if I were one, we just look at, you know, this extensive difference. If you, uh, because R sort of um, uh, has a measure of um, the, is related to the size or the width of the peak and the sense of difference with the distance between the peaks, then the, uh, one, one could look at, at this uh, combined. So, uh, so this covers most of the formal things. Uh, um, now, so here are just some plots. So for our system, starting with the um, FICO zero state or pi, uh, FICO pi states, this is solid and dashed lines here. So they, they are very relative qualitatively pretty close, close. Let's walk through the various quantities here. Uh, first of all, uh, lambda. Lambda is this black curves. Uh, oh, okay, let, let me talk about the x-axis first. Uh, okay, so, um, Lambda, if you remember, the two peaks were relatively far apart for, uh, throughout any temperature. So temperature is in the x-axis, essentially low temperatures to the, to the left and high temperatures to the left. Okay. So this is these black curves, the, the, just by looking at the extensive difference, um, didn't tell any difference, but it's important that it's large. Uh, the scale here is uh, 100 means full polarization. Um, it, there are 100 particles in the system. Okay, so um, now let's look at uh, R sub Q, this quantity I just talked about. In the beginning, it was a, um, uh, at uh, t, equal, uh, t equal zero, and close to t equal zero, it was a pure state. And uh, you start looking on this scale here, it starts at one. And now we're increasing temperature. And here is the crossover. Uh, 
Um, okay, so that actually does show the behavior one. Is a quantum to classical crossover. So here, uh, uh, large sensor difference, RQ, uh, RQ close to one, that is, um, that is a Schrodinger cat. Um, and as temperature increases, it just continues to become more and more of a mixture. The indefiniteness went away. The alive and dead states being microscopically well-defined still state. Okay, so just seeing two peaks does not mean cat. Okay, uh, here we also have a few other uh, quantities. Uh, uh, the R sub C is because remember the, um, the quantum feature information was the um, maximum of the classical feature information. So I can also define a similar quantity here, but with um, the quantum feature information um, replaced by the classical feature information. So that will always be below the quantum one. So that's just for comparison, uh, RC. Okay, so that's always below. Uh, uh, okay, I, I should say a few more things. So because the classical part depends on what, um, uh, what without I choose. So here, uh, having done the, the, the general discussion, I go back to this particular system where um, uh, I'm interested in, um, in a phase imprinted by JZ. Okay, so I'm going to um, the, the first, the second step in the, the, the deferometer is to uh, rotate in the Z direction. Okay, and then uh, th that is the, the quantity I'm interested in, in looking at the variance, the, the, the figure with double peaks is a measure of JZ. But uh, now when I do the sensitivity, I can choose various um, uh, readouts. And if I want the maximum sensitivity of uh, the JZ, uh, with, um, on the JZ measurement, uh, uh, when, when I do some, do some, um, some change in that parameter of the JZ, the, the, the quantity, the readout that will change the most is anything in the XY plane. So it makes sense to choose uh, um, R to be in the XY plane. Here is for J1. So if I chose something else, you have a family of curves here spanning this whole region. Uh, and uh, this is a, a some obvious choice, but the, the full problem is much more complicated. You, you may have some, um, you know, there's a, a infinite number of directions you can choose and the quantum um, feature information just chooses the highest one, the absolute highest. So this, um, so the, the one message here is that even if experimentally you cannot get the optimal one, even just by looking at the, some good choice of the classical one, you may still have a good idea, a good diagnosis. Okay, and then this combined uh, quantity the, um, uh, of the um, extensive difference with the, um, this, this R, which we call it the quality of indefiniteness, uh, is the green curve. Yeah, that's also that tells you the, the, about the transition. Okay, any questions? I'm almost done. I will just discuss one more. Of the Quick, very quick application, but it may be a little bit more physical. Okay, so that's essentially the, 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 the whole idea. Uh, but maybe to make it. Um, okay, maybe to make contact with something, uh, one hand simple where I can do calculations exactly. And, but also closer to the actual Schrodinger thought experiment. Uh, let me consider um, uh, some cat state, but now I will focus on uh, whether it's entangled with a qubit, which will represent the, uh, the, the atom from the radioactive source. 
Okay, that's actually, uh, it's not just the cat, but the cat entangled with, um, with a cubic. So I, I will parameterize the state this way because that is a very convenient thing. So I have this cat state. This is the, my system. This is where my, my uh, experiments will be done uh, on just live or dead. Um, but it, it is actually entangled with uh, this cubic and in this form. Uh, this is, uh, this form is just chosen for convenience. So uh, I have this other qubit. If I choose uh, uh, cosine of eta to be one, then sine eta is zero. That just means it's not really entangled at all. These are just, this is just factorizes as two pure states. And then the, the opposite limit where uh, sine of eta is one, cosine is zero, is the fully entangled. Fully entangled means Fully entangled, the cat is fully entangled with the qubit. When I do the uh, density matrix and integrate out the qubit, I have a complete mixture. I have a mixture of well defined dead and alive, dead plus alive mixture of defined. The, the other case, when, they were, when the cat state is a pure state, that's um, when the property, the vital status of the cat is an indefinite property. As the when it's a pure state. Okay, so this is a very simple state. Uh, I can actually just uh, look at all the uh, operations I can do to the system. I uh, and I, I can just exactly calculate the quantum fission information. I can uh, then from there uh, calculate um, uh, this uh, quality of indefiniteness. So the statistical um, uh, distribution has some width. And um, uh, so this way I don't have to introduce a temperature. Um, and uh, uh, um, Okay, so uh, what comes out from this calculation is an expression like this for the quality of indefiniteness. Alpha is a, is a parameter, is, can be actually written as the extensive difference divided by the peak width. And when cosine of eta is one, uh, RQ is, is perfectly one. So that's a perfect cap. Um, and uh, once you start entangling with this environment, this qubit, then um, cosine of eta becomes smaller than one and RQ becomes smaller than one. You lose some of the the indefiniteness. Um, okay, uh, and early, I think that that's essentially it. Um, so that there, uh, we have to go through some some measures and some careful bounds, uh, but that's essentially the idea. The, the key thing is, um, well, we want to know the indefiniteness. The when you do measurements, you get uh, uncertainty for really distributions. And um, the idea that we propose is to use interferometry to uh, be able to quantify that, uh, how much is coming from indefiniteness. So we really need to uh, have these uh, somewhat formal steps is really uh, trying to figure out the source of that uncertainty. So if you can put a bound, you know, um, uh, upper bound for the, the part of the uncertainty that comes from the quantum, only the indefiniteness and compare that with the total you have. Uh, even if you have a lot of uncertainty in quantum, but the overall uh, uncertainty is much bigger, then that means your the catness is actually a small percentage of your system. So so that's essentially the main idea. If, uh, okay, um, that's essentially it. So this is uh, Shane, who was a graduate student with me. He um, uh, had uh, was had support from this program UC Labs, so he um, he was actually co-advised by me and Eddie Timmermans from uh, Los Alamos, and um, the paper is this. Uh, I know often uh, Registin is the first uh, author because by for doing most of the work, and it is the case, but it is also the case actually uh, here that uh, Shane actually came up with the problem. And um, took a, you know, was actually the, 
the main person in most aspects, uh, I would say all aspects. And, um, uh, and Eddie and I, I think, learned a lot <laughs> about this new field. Uh, so he's a um, really upcoming young scientist too. Uh, so he just started a postdoc in, uh, in Germany. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, are there any questions? I, so I have another question, which is um, you, um, when you included temperature, you were assuming, I guess, a Boltzmann distribution for the bosons. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but um, if we think about coupling to the environment, so say you really had a bath uh, and you were coupling these bosons to the environment, would there be additional sources of decoherence that need to be accounted for in, um, in these estimates? Uh, yes. Um, yeah, so the temperature was just introduced as a boson factor. It's not um, um, you know, fully uh, containing all the, the, um, the components. So for a bath, maybe one could start modeling by, by the, along the lines of the last example. Like we said, a qubit would have to have modes of the bath, and um, there may be dissipation. Um, so, yeah, there, there would be uh, other terms, but the limit, the bound on the quantum, on the quantum, the quantum part that comes from that uh, would still be valid. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah as long as your system, the, the main system remains as it is, you know, losing particles. And, Jim, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. And, um, Sean, when I, I really enjoyed it. I was kind of on the edge of understanding certain things. And um, this, this, I, this interferometer idea, uh, and, and I thought about the two-well system that Brad you know, echoed again that, as, as one of the systems we should be thinking about. Um, these operations that maybe change the interference or, or probe the interference, can I imagine that maybe as uh, an experimental perturbation where you, you move the bottoms of the two wells closer or farther apart to change uh, the interference or? Uh, well, so for that, I think, it's, let me first talk in terms of spins. So the, the what we would do is really just rotate the spin uh, along the z-axis. Okay, okay. Uh, so how that translates into the double well? Um, it is a little bit <laughs> less physical. Uh, okay. For the double well, that would be like having a different phase for the two, the two wells, I guess. The bosons in one well would be phasing one way, and in the other well, they'd be phasing the other way. Is that, is that right? Because it would be Jay-Z, you, you'd be... Yeah, yeah so you are, you're changing uh, phi. <laughs> Uh, the azimuthal. Uh, um, so you'll be moving along this line. So that that um, rot when you do that yeah. rotation, how quickly can you do it? How, how quickly are you allowed to do it? Good questions. Uh, so, um, Yeah, 
it's a good question. I, I um, think you want um, you want fast things. You want to do it uh, and not um, start in this. Um, so essentially, you run that for some delta t, and that will give you a measure of the 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 phase imprinted. So you want you don't want to do it through many cycles and uh, let it evolve phase. You want to do uh, uh, some amount that is uh, um, that then you can measure the what happened with the probability distribution. Uh, so these so are. It sounds really too fast then. Yeah, it's not a very satisfactory answer in the sense that I, I don't, I can't give you a number. I, but the, the physical picture is that it's fast, and um, you want to essentially build that derivative. You want to change, put a little pi, and let's see what happens with the. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So what you could would, would in an experiment, you would say, do the pi equals zero, nothing, and then do a little delta. And okay. And then build the fast coefficient information. So, the, so, so you can get that derivative. Yeah. So, what your question is, what should that delta be? What bounds? So, we want that to be small, so that the derivative is meaningful. I see. Thank you, Sean Wen. I really enjoyed that. I've got to run. See you, Jim. Okay, good seeing you. Yes, I'll, likewise. I'll see you next week. Yes. <laughs> I'll be asking the questions. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I, I have one other question, which is uh, since Vesna was listening uh, and she does NMR experiments, um, it, as a physical realization of this, have you thought about uh, large uh, nuclei with large spin? Um, so I mean, you've mapped this to a spin model, but you could literally have a spin and maybe, maybe, yeah, even a spin nine halves or something that uh, might exist in nature. Have people considered um, uh, this theory in that context? Um, um, I, I have not. Um, uh, Well, everything here applies except this is, um, we are kind of limit of large spins. So nine halves may be large enough. Um, I have not seen, uh, well, so, so we, at the end, we all only just work with the spin system. So it would fit uh, uh, right in. Uh, the, um, the production of the cat um, may not be necessary if you have other ways to produce a cat, but if we, it is also, but could also be applied uh, as long as it's justified to, uh, you know, you, uh, to have um, that you, you can do that Hamiltonian, which has the JZ term, which is um, some field in the X direction, JX term, sorry, the, the Hawking term will be a field in X direction, and it needs to have a JZ squared term. So the, the limits that you've derived here are uh, in the large n limit, uh, and are there corrections if n is finite that need to be considered, or can I still um, bring this over to even a finite n? The kramer rao bounds and all the, the discussion of the analysis um, it does not depend on n being large. So it's just a um, you know, you, you can do interferometry, you can uh, imagine um, uh, doing, you know, one spin and measuring whether it's a, a superposition or not. So in the last example, I don't even say what um, life and dead is, it could be just another qubit. It could be, so you're just looking at the indefinite of single qubit and then you can uh, entangle with another. The part that does depend on large n it's just a preparation. So if you have a spin that you already can have the control, then 
that part is not a problem. And the, the plant information analysis, the feature information analysis uh, does not depend, it would apply for any space. Uh, uh, the general idea of extracting from the sensitivity of interferometric measurement, extracting some estimate is um, very general. It okay. did not even have to be a spin. The spin is natural to talk about interferometry, but it could be any operation actually. Does not even have to be a spin. Yeah, nuclear spin might be attractive because a lot of these operations are things that NMR people do. Um, so uh, it would be possible to test out some of these ideas. It is very funny that you asked us. Hi, hi, hi. Uh, really nice talk. Um, I love your question. I was dealing with that today, um, Brad, when we actually did the simulations of the pulses. Uh -huh. So you can do circularly polarized and then you can totally see. Um, I mean, it's amazing what you can do with the density matrices of higher, like quadrupolar coupled nuclear system. Um, and yeah. So in a nutshell, there are a lot of just really useful things that you can do, especially with these circularly polarized pulses. So you can pump, you know, manipulate them and create these kind of states, you know, where, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, depending on how you apply your RF pulse, you can make them, you know, rotate in basically one direction versus the other. So like a negative frequency with the resonance is. And so, um, yeah, it's a, you can totally map this and you can also it's, it's kind of easy to do that in a lab to implement that so maybe you could have um these um varying temperature and see measure the cat and see the cat disappear hopefully yeah it's a function of temperature because all of this calculation is of course it's you know ideal system but yeah i'm sure that that would be actually quite interesting to do so i don't know we'll, we'll explore that <laughs> yeah uh, I'll, I'll read your paper and see if we can uh, think of uh, an MR experiment along those lines. Okay. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. We, we thought a little bit about um, putting uh, dissipation um, and seeing how, uh, you know, how clear these transitions would still be, but we, we didn't do anything. We didn't do anything. <coughs> Well, fortunately for that, uh, at least for the nuclei, the dissipation is really tiny, so uh, it's pretty ideal for this. Well, thank you very much for telling us about this work. Okay, thank you. I may thank you. some questions.